upon the Conservation Forests and Lands Amendment Bill 2022. Eastern Victoria region has a rich history of forestry. In East Gippsland, the local logging industry had its beginnings in the 1880s. While now, my electorate is home to the Australian paper mill, which is just one example of um, a big employer in our area. Um, and it relies on an industry, uh, a functioning timber industry. Now, forestry uh, is also a significant industry in neighbouring regions and also important to those in the inner city who live in homes built with timber frames, wooden stairs, floorboards and their wooden furniture. These people may not experience the industry firsthand, but they will certainly feel the consequences if the industry continues to suffer. And sadly, that is what is happening. The industry is suffering. The bill before us is brief, but gives broad powers to the Minister and Secretary of the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning. These broad powers enable the Minister or Secretary to create legally binding directions around the management of our forestry industry. It also provides that any matter contained in any document, standard or specification may be adopted or incorporated into the Code of Practice for Timber Production 2014. As it stands, Vic Forests must comply with the precautionary principle. And many of my colleagues in the chamber have uh, raised this today too. There have been numerous legal disputes around the definition of this principle. The principle is effectively about taking steps to protect against threats. Biodiversity should be preserved and regrettable future outcomes avoided. Many cases before the courts have arisen because there is no useful definition of what constitutes a threat. This has led to ongoing yet avoidable tension, particularly in my region, between timber harvesters and environmental activists. I've already mentioned the Code of Practice. The Code of Practice was implemented to acknowledge that the timber industry impacts the environment and to find ways to protect areas that are particularly vulnerable. It seeks to strike a balance between allowing a vital industry to operate while minimising impact on the environment. It is evident that it has failed in its aim. For example, the state-owned Vic Forests has been accused by activists and researchers of logging illegally on steep slopes around water catchment areas that may cause contamination to our drinking water. Yet despite numerous allegations, Vic Forests continues to effectively defend against the activist cases brought against it. But at what cost? As a result of the anger over perceived abuses by Vic Forests, Activist groups have focused on Borbor, Lake Sentrance and New G, where they persistently organise protests, such as sitting in trees or weaving in and out of logging coops, creating a danger to themselves and to harvesters. The activists persistently use the courts to bring costly injunctions against the forestry industry that interfere and block essential supply. Given the current backlogged state of Victoria's court system, cases can be drawn out for years. They are contributing to timber shortages and creating costs and delays. Yet activists feel this is justified because their interpretation of the law is different to that of Vic Forests. And only the courts are empowered to decide which position is genuinely, genuinely aligned with the law. This situation is bad for everyone. Vic Forests is paralysed by court cases while activists remain embittered that they didn't get the outcomes they expected. Clear sensible laws must exist so that everyone has confidence that our reward remains uncontaminated, that threatened species are protected, all while allowing forestry to operate, but within a balanced ethical framework. As I said earlier, the code of practice exists to strike a balance. There has not been balance, only uncertainty. This is why so many people are protesting. The industry has to navigate rules that create such complexity and ambiguity that it's impossible for professional activists to convince themselves and others that only corrupt behaviour would lead to the logging decisions taken by Vic Forests. To date, the courts have not accepted these arguments. The details of the arguments are typically so complex that few, few fully understand them. The rule of law rarely functions well in such circumstances. It is not surprising that both sides are convinced they are right. If Vic Forrest has made every effort to be compliant and log within the law, but activists read the law from an entirely different viewpoint. If the criteria for protection are poorly constructed, costly and complicated to apply, then they are worse than useless. Everyone loses. Desired environmental protections aren't afforded 
and business faces crippling costs no matter how hard it tries to do the right thing. The forestry industry needs to be able to determine with certainty what can and cannot be logged in a cost-effective way so that even if objections exist, they can be resolved quickly, convincingly and definitively. Yet we also need a clear and effective environmental protections because our environment is a great treasure to our children and our children's children should have the benefit of. And make no mistake, the long cycles of the forestry industry are on that generational scale. We need clear rules and better oversight. These new guidelines must ensure that environmental practices are taken into consideration with clear boundaries to avoid drawn out situations where it takes years to determine the law and if it was really breached. This will give the forestry industry the ability it so desperately needs to properly plan long term and predict how best to succeed in providing business and consumers with essential materials that are now in short supply. The forestry business cannot function without the ability to perform genuine long-term planning, and that means absolute certainty over legal matters and supply eligibility for several decades to come. Alas, these new discretionary powers will sit with a government that has been disturbingly unforthcoming about the future of the sector. By 2030, we will be required to rely solely on plantation wood, yet the necessary plantations take between 20 and 30 years to reach full maturity. The reality gap is obvious. If we are going to end native timber supply and rely on plantations, we need thousands of hectares to be planted right now. Even then, 2030 is obviously a wildly optimistic date. And if we don't start planning now, what will happen in the meantime? We are already seeing the negative impacts of undersupplied timber industry. Homeowners and renovators have been forced to wait nine months or more for trusses to be delivered. Victoria is battling a huge undersupply of timber products and homeowners are being slugged with cost increases due to enormous demand and little supply. Nationally, building costs rose 7.3% last year, which is the biggest surge in construction costs in 16 years. No doubt this, like everything else, will be blamed on the pandemic, and yet it was clearly avoidable. If we are not going to produce enough wood here in Victoria, where will it come from? That is the question this government fails to answer we will be swapping our homegrown renewable timber for imports that create far more global damage than a well-regulated job-creating local industry. Will we be creating yet another fragile supply chain that leaves us at the mercy of authoritarians and increasingly destabilising world events? I know I would much rather see our timber sourced sustainably, ethically and securely here in Victoria, building Victorian jobs and Victorian prosperity not feeding into the profits of fat cat overseas commodity speculators. We need to strike a balance between protecting the environment and continuing an ethical and sustainable forestry industry. This will ensure we minimise reliance on imported wood from countries that do not care about setting new records for deforestation. And even if we could source timber remotely in an ethical and sustainable manner, local industries such as the Australian paper in Maryvale, Latrobe Valley's largest employer, one of them, will rely, <coughs> rely on the economies of a local timber industry. We must have a reliable source of local timber. The devastation facing the industry is leaving lifelong harvesting families out of work and has the potential to render an otherwise prosperous paper industry Un unviable, resulting in an economic dissolution of the eastern region. We need more local timber processing, not less, and it is impossible without competitive and dependable local supply. If passed, I urge the government to use these new powers to strike this balance and finally get it right, because without a sustainable timber industry, we are all impacted. Thank you, Ms Burnett.